Um, So-called thing theory um, emerged, as it were, um, if not exactly fully armed, then apparently fully formed in 2001 when um, uh, Bill Brown edited um, a special issue of the journal Critical Inquiry that was subsequently issued as a book simply entitled Things. Um, Bill Brown's own essay in that collection, which is entitled Thing Theory, um, suggested that things had become both a problem and a kind of opportunity for theory itself. So, you know, if he'd been a smart aleck, like people like to be, uh, he could have had a slash in between the thing and the theory rather than a hyphen. Because in a certain sense, things, he said, seem to stand on the other side of theory. As a matter of fact, he proposed influential, influentially and highly quotably um, in, that, in that essay that um, really there are two kinds of thing. This, this word is going to give us trouble all today, I'm afraid, but it might be a useful kind of thing. There are two kinds of thing. There are objects and there are things. And the, th the interesting thing about things is that it's that things are both specific and general, and, and specific and, and highly general. You know, we we use the word thing when we say, oh, you know, what's that? What's that thing you do to, to the the thing to the thing? Um, there's something kind of fuzzy and unformed about the use of this word thing that seems in contrast to an object. And this is how he distinguishes um, in what I'm about to say is actually a very traditional kind of way, objects and things. If you look at the first quotation, objects are things that play their part and know their place. They function in recognisable ways. They do their work. We know what they are. <clears throat> we look through objects, he says, because there are codes by which our interpretive attention makes them meaningful. A thing, in contrast, can hardly function as a window. We begin to confront the thingness of objects when they stop working for us, when the drill breaks, when the car stalls, when the windows get filthy, so on. Um, he's recalling here <coughs> a very famous point that Heidegger makes at the beginning of his Being and Time in writing about the, the kind of stuff another word that will be around a lot today, that he calls Zoik. In German, Zoik is sort of gear or equipment or kit, stuff for doing stuff with Zoik, uh, often translated as equipment. And, and Heidegger says, we only confront the objectness of stuff when it starts breaking down, starts breaking down, when it stops working. That we only get a sense of the hammeriness of the hammer when the head flies off or it you know, whatever. Actually, not much can happen to a hammer. To, how, how does a hammer stop working? But anyway, and, um, and this is a very, very powerful notion and completely untrue, actually, uh, in my view. Um, there are all kinds of operations involved in which we are fully aware of the thingness of things as we're using them. And in fact, there's a whole class of objects in which I've been particularly interested recently because I've been trying to write about sport, in which the very awareness of the thinginess of the thing that we're using is what the sport is about. In a certain sense, you can say that the game of tennis is about trying to understand the, the range, the play, as we might say, of possible uses and possible engagements and interactions that you can have with this particular kind of object, um, in, with this other particular rounder, fuzzier kind of object. So, powerful but false, um, which is always a good place uh, to start, I think. Um, for, uh, and this is interesting for Brown because he, it, it, it seems to him that in a certain sense we, we're at a moment in which there may be a kind of an excess or saturation of theory or concepts. There's a kind of need that is being felt on, on, on many fronts for a kind of return to the thinginess of things, to the indistinctness or uncertainty, the indeterminacy, the, the non-finiteness of things, that things might become newly interesting because newly enigmatic. Newly, but also um, uh, uh, there's a repetition involved in this because at, for much of the, of the 20th century, a point that, that Brown makes, there's been a similar series of returns to the strangeness of things. Um, perhaps there hasn't been a century in which 
things have seemed so odd, so mysterious, so um, uh, sometimes sinisterly opposite to us. <coughs> um, and also, for that reason, perhaps, full of opportunity, William Carlos Williams, um, uh, in his poem, A Sort of Song, uh, offers the formula, no ideas but in things. Um, and there might be other moments one might look at, one, one might think about the salience of objects in surrealism, um, in the work of a writer like Francis Ponge, uh, writing in the 1940s and 50s, or in Chauvinism, as it was called, works of Alain Rob Grier with their uh, extraordinary fascination um, with objects and attempts to get away from all, uh, every possible kind of subjectivity. Um, I, just as a kind of guiding principle, I'd like to propose that we can see over the century a kind of move from a, a mood of melancholy and menace in relation to things to a kind of enchantment, a kind of re-accommodation to the world of things. Somehow the world of things uh, represents a different kind of problem and opportunity. Um, why might things have become newly interesting to us? Well, one explanation, I think by now rather a corny one, rather a fatigued one, is that we are just surrounded and assailed by so many different kinds of things. Um, you know, we are surrounded by consumer objects in more, uh, more abundance than ever before. Um, another context for this concern or fascination with things might be the fact that might be the fact that uh, that things seem to be changing their nature. That many of the things with which we are surrounded and which we ourselves surround, or which we wear, or ingest, or you know, the prepositions aren't quite clear anymore are objects that seem to be dematerializing us. I mean, many of the objects, the physical things that we have that weigh us down, are things that actually seem to decorporealize us. They make it possible for us to be in touch with in lots of different places at once. So the virtualizing effect of objects seems to be something new. And I suppose the third context is the question of our relation more broadly to non-human things, to the non-human things of the world. Um, and the growth of a kind of an ecological consciousness, um, I think, is often at work. Um, all of these things uh, might um, uh, come usefully to be illuminated just a bit in the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, but before we get there, I mean, I'd like, to, I'd like just to dwell a little bit on my own particular preoccupation with things, and that is to say their work in thought um, it's not a simple thing to think about a thing because human beings don't know what thinking is. I mean, thinking is not an object that you can put on a table and look at, although we, we have lots of ways in which we like to try to do that. We do like to have a kind of an image or an objectified form for our thinking itself. Sometimes literary forms can seem to uh, correspond or approximate to those objectified forms of the act of thought itself. Um, and uh, so I suggested you might, you might read a piece that, um, that I wrote about that that's called Thinking Things. And in a sense, that, that was a response to uh, a strong current um, of thinking about things that I just want briefly to draw attention to. The way into it is probably... Um, through the quotation from Jacques uh, Lacan that I've given you as number two. Um, Lacan, in his seventh seminar, uh, develops a series of meditations on Freud's use of a term, das Ding, which in German means, broadly, the thing. Um, uh, but is, um, is contrasted with another word which also means the thing in German, die Sache, um, which, um, which Freud draws a contrast with. Um, uh, die Sache has a broader meaning. It can mean things like, you know, the affair, the concern, the matter at hand. Um, and Lacan develops uh, an argument that, um, that there is, as it were, within every subject, 
some hole, some absence, some lack. And that lack is a kind of a is a kind of a thing, a thing that you can never get hold of, but it's a kind of a black hole that organizes everything around it. That is das Ding. It's a thing that has all the forcefulness, all the sort of salience and gravitational pull of a thing, but it sort of isn't there. That's the point about it. <coughs> this is why, I'm dipping into this quotation number two, he can say, das Ding is that which I will call the, the beyond of the signified. It's thing, the thing is the thing that language can't get hold of. A very, very, very ancient and traditional way of thinking about objects. As, you know, objects as things that language can't uh, grasp. The thing is not nothing, but literally is not. It's characterized by its absence, its strangeness. Now, in this, he's reflecting on an essay by Heidegger, which is called um, uh, uh, das Ding, which is about... Which is about um, not a, in fact a vase, as uh, Lacan here says, um, but, a, but a pot, an earthenware pot. And the, the thing that interests Heidegger in this is that the pot is hollow. Um, and of course that's the thing uh, about the thing, oh God help us, <laughs> that Lacan uh, seizes on. Um, if, last part of that quotation, if you consider the vase from the point of view I first proposed as an object made to represent the emptiness at the centre of the real that is called the thing, this emptiness as represented in the representation presents itself as a nihil, as nothing. In other words, we need a kind of an object, a thing, to imagine, and, and both Heidegger and Lacan assume that in a certain sense this is a primary thing, this is one of the first things we're likely to make. If you make a mud pie, you sort of make a hole in it, too, to give it a shape, to give it a dimension. It's a thing, it's an object, it's got extension in the world, which signifies non-signification. It signifies this fact of not being able to grasp the thing. Um, it's a very peculiar and I think a very rich kind of entanglement of things being there and not being there, which is at work in every single instance and occasion of utterance, because that's what language is and does. Language brings things forwards by, by not bringing them forwards, um, by what we call referring. Uh, it's a theme that's taken up in a book uh, which is about uh, melancholy relations to present and absent things by Peter Schwenger, which is called The Tears of Things, and that's the third quotation. If there is a murder of the thing by the word, this does not definitively annihilate that thing, it only transposes it to the scene of an interminable haunting of language. Well, um, I want to switch now to another, uh, not exactly prime mover, but certainly very, very strong influence in thinking about things, and that's the philosopher, historian of science, many other things, uh, Michel Serre. Bit of a problem thinking and writing, talking about Michel Serre because uh, he has around 38, 39, 40 books to his name. He's 81 this year. He's still producing two or three books a year. Uh, it's very hard for translators, let alone readers, uh, readers, let alone translators, to keep up with this torrential rate. And, and as a result, pretty hard to keep up with Michel Serre if you're not a, a French reader. Um, this is particularly the case with the particular argument that I just want to point you to, which occurs in a book called Statue, Statues, uh, which isn't um, yet translated. But there, Serre develops an argument about about objects and their relationship to subjects. That I think is really quite like Lacan. Serre hates psychoanalysis, but actually there's an interesting sort of rhyming uh, of concerns here. Serre's argument is that only the things called subjects can bring about the things they call objects. So although we might, if we didn't think about it very much, assume that um, animals, for example, uh, who, who don't have the kind of consciousness or subjectivity that we accredit ourselves with, um, that animals might live in a world just full of things, full of objects. In fact, Serre's argument is that animals only have concepts. They only have a world in which things are for things. And if there, there is no category of things that are not for anything in particular, there's no category of meaningless thing for an animal. There's nothing that drops outside their web of 
of concepts. Only the things called subjects can have the conception of what he calls the transcendental object. Um, I think he calls, yeah, yeah, the transcendental constitution of the object. Subjects come into being in the awareness that there is that thing, whatever it might be, he takes the example just simply of stone, that is not me, that is absolutely and entirely not me, that stands absolutely opposite to me. That's what object means. Ob, up against, and yak airy, to throw. It's that which I come up against in a kind of absolute way. And yet, curiously, I can only come up against that absolute otherness, as we might say, the absolute otherness of the, the material world, of the objective world, because I take myself to be, because I come into being in a kind of recoil from it. So the object and the subject are forged, as it were, at that, at that moment, or in his, uh, his formulation. It's a kind of a, a primary, a primal spiral. I imagine, he says, end of the first paragraph, at the origin, a rapid vortex in which the transcendental constitution of the object by the subject grows, just like, in the other direction, the symmetrical constitution of the subject by the object, in dizzying semicycles, endlessly renewed. Um, and for Sarah, whatever it is we mean by a subject is always, therefore, entangled with these things that, it, it, that are not it, with its own death. And thinking is, therefore, precisely death. I think, he says in one of a million re reversionings of uh, the Cartesian cogito you can find throughout his work, final sentence of the second paragraph, I think, therefore, I consent to die of the object, to lie under the stone interred. I think, therefore, I vanish. Elsewhere, sir, will write, um, Où je pense, là je ne suis pas. Where I think, there I am not. And it's just, just a kind of, a, in, in a sense, a kind of simple, intuitive understanding. When you're thinking about something, you're gone. You're thinking about the thing you're thinking about. It's a point that David Hume makes um, in uh, responding to and uh, refuting Descartes. Serre develops in a number of other works, but principally in a book called The Parasite, which... Um, uh, thankfully is translated, a notion of that work of constitution collectivized. What happens when these objects that form subjects start to be exchanged, start to be held in common by subjects held in common? What happens when objects begin to work in and on collectivity? You get what are called quasi-objects in Serre's work. It's a term that is taken up by Bruno Latour, um, and probably most people know it because of the way in which it's been used by Bruno Latour. Um, it's, it has its origin in, uh, in Serre's writing in this book in um, 19, 1980, I think, in, in, in the French. Um, and Serre invites us to think of a quasi-object as being like an object in a game, um, perhaps not so much like my, my tennis racket, um, but uh, he talks about the fure, which is a kind of a, a little kind of very thing uh, in a game rather like Hunt the Slipper, which is rapidly um, transferred. Or think of Pass the Parcel, or a game of rugby. So as a great rugby fan, um, the, the fact that this is a game where, when it's being played, interestingly, the game is in, uh, the, the ball is in rapid motion. And the motion of the ball is everything. You know, when the ball is stopped, as it were, the game is stopped. He takes this as an image for the forming, the intermittent forming of individuals and collectives. I'll start about halfway through the quotation. The quasi-object, when being passed, makes the collective. If it stops, it makes the individual. There's the parcel. The music has stopped. You have to unwrap it. You're you. You're stuck with, suddenly with who you are. If he is discovered, he is it. More, that's um, in this game of the fourée. Who's the subject? Who is an I or who am I? The moving fourée weaves the we, the collective. If it stops, it marks the I. The quasi-object that is a marker of the subject is an astonishing constructor of intersubjectivity. Um, that phrase itself, it seems to me, might be regarded as generative of a vast amount of work um, that's begun to be conducted um, in the last 
few decades across a, a large number of disciplines. Not least work um, encouraged by the example of Bruno Latour, who I've just mentioned. If you don't know anything about Michel Serre, the best way into his work is in a series of conversations that Serre had with Bruno Latour, which was published under the title Conversations on Science, Culture and Time, in 19, the English translation in 1996, I think. Um, it's a wonderful review of the whole of Serre's work up to that point. Unfortunately, it was 16 years and therefore 20 books or so ago uh, for Serre. But it, you know, it gets you halfway through very, very quickly and efficiently. Um, and clearly makes it clear, I think, in what sense uh, Latour sees Serre's work as, as important, not to say indispensable. Bruno Latour... Um, uh, somewhat, I think, to his irritation, is often cited as the leading exponent of something called actor network theory, um, which doesn't really operate anymore. Most of the people who are identified with actor network theory, which I'll characterize briefly in just a moment, um, would no longer say that that's what they do. Um, if you want an account of actor network theory, well, it's not the not the best account you could have, but um, you might want to look at Bruno Latour's um, recent book, it's on the reading list, Reassembling the Social, an Introduction to Actor Network Theory. It's a bit of a joke, really, because it isn't really an introduction. It's more of an au revoir or farewell to actor network theory. <coughs> um, you'll see it's quite recent, 2008, but the joke is that somehow you know, uh, Latour and others Michel Callon is one of the names uh, involved. Latour and others during the 1980s developed a way of looking at scientific objects, principally scientific objects, and giving them a kind of prominence in the analysis of the history of science and of especially of scientific practice, for example, in laboratory and experimental practice, um, that was much more material. Um, that's the principle of actor network theory. And uh, uh, the reason it's called actor network theory is that it centers on the actions of objects, or, or, or rather it centers on a, a, an enlarged range of different kind of actors or things that can perform actions, not consciously, but things nevertheless that can have um, salience, things that as Latour puts it at one point, things that warp time and space around them. And of course, Einstein showed that time and space is warped just by big, heavy objects. That's the kind of thing um, that Latour has in mind. Um, if you look at quotation eight, um, I've headed objects are actors, you get a, a kind of a sense of the attitude that Latour has. Um, uh, Anything that does modify a state of affairs by making a difference, he says in the first sentence of that quotation, is an actor, or an actant. Um, and then a quotation that is um, often reproduced, I think uh, uh, Isabel may be drawing attention to it, um, that follows, that, that points, of, points to the, uh, the absolute requirement of the things that we do things with to our understanding, um, sorry, the absolute requirement of the cooperation of the things uh, that we do things with to the doing of them, the absolute requirement of that for our understanding of them. Um, more recently, Bill Brown has, I think, uh, uh, kind of drawn on this conception, uh, which I, I think it will be you know, mistaken to say uh, came into the world uh, entirely new with actor network theory. Um, um, in fact, you know, the point about this is how it does, in fact, chime with, um, with, with the ways of understanding objects that actually have, been, that have become quite mature, quite developed in a number of other fields. But Bill Brown um, has, in more recent work, for example, in an essay of 2010 in Critical Inquiry, that the next quotation comes from, has um, drawn on anthropological or ethnographic uh, traditions of thinking about the importance of objects in securing various kinds of collectivity. Securing, but also, in a way, breaking and transforming uh, collectivity. One of the odd things about objects is that they're the ways in which human collectivities often try to 
pin themselves down, to give their collectivities, which are otherwise, as Latour would want to say, very volatile or ephemeral things, hard to secure from moment to moment, things, as it were, weigh them down, sandbag them, give them permanence. Uh, but things also have a way of, of, um, of putting things into motion. So, you know, things are on that, on that sort of dividing line between the spatial and the temporal. Um, so, uh, Brown develops this nice notion that he calls object culture. By object culture, I mean to, de to designate the objects through which a culture constitutes itself. This I'm reading now from quotation nine, which is to say culture as it is objectified in material forms. A given object culture entails the practical and symbolic use of objects. It thus entails both the ways that inanimate objects mediate human relations and the ways that humans mediate object relations, generate, generating differences of value, significance, and permanence among them. Thus, the systems, material, economic, symbolic, through which objects become meaningful or fail to. And actually, in saying this, uh, in a certain sense, Bill Brown is simply recalling what was meant to be the force of the word culture when it was arguably first used in its modern anthropological sense, that is to say, in the book by E.B. Tyler of 1871, called Primitive Culture. What Tyler insisted in that book was, to understand a culture, you had to take into account everything about that collection of human beings, what they did, how they did it, and what they did it with. So all the objects, all the artifacts, as well as all the beliefs, all the social institutions, and so forth. That's somehow bound up in the idea of culture, and yet, in a curious way, the objects in the 100, 120 or so years following Tyler seem to have sort of dropped out of it. More and more and more and more, we've had a, an understanding of culture as somehow the opposite of all the material stuff, the physical stuff, the merely natural stuff. Cultures are forms of signification, forms of communication. They therefore are somehow immaterial. That's the way we tend to think. Cultures are on the other side from things. Um, in the work of Brown, in the work of those inspired by actor network theory and lots of other ethnographic um, traditions, um, uh, there's that same kind of circulating, oscillating, mutual constitution of subjects and objects, cultures and natures all the time, following the model of that um, spiral suggested by Sayre, perhaps. Um, so just a few more moves, a few more um, uh, aspects of thing thinking uh, that I'll draw to your attention. Um, I think, it's, I think it's useful to, to think about the different areas out of which, or in which thing thinking has flourished and out of which um, the models have come. Um, and in some of these areas, you know, thing theory is not news at all. In art history, in archaeology, in museum studies, things are just what you work with. If there weren't any things in play, there will be no discipline. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of obvious. Um, and it is true that, um, that quite a lot of, the, um, quite a lot of the, the work that has been done in what's often being called thing theory um, focuses on things like the action, the history of collecting. What is it about collecting? What happens when you collect objects and put them into some kind of form? Um, so I've given you a reference to a book edited by John Elsner and Roger Cardinal, um, unaccountably, Elsner comes after plots in my alphabetical system, a uh, somewhat Borgesian uh, arrangement that I've adopted. But their book is called Cultures of Collecting. It's, it's not brand new, um, but it does give you um, a, a sense of how some of, these, um, some of these questions resonate within the study of collection. I've mentioned the science and technology studies that was characteristic of actor network theory. Um, there is a certain strain of um, psychology, especially um, uh, a psychology associated with the work of Sherry Turkle um, that um, uh, has been very responsive to the new arrangements, the new kinds of um, assemblages, 
uh, or combinations that human beings are being called upon to form with objects. Well, being called upon to form with objects all the time, but in recent times with a, with a category of very new and interesting sort of quasi-object, intelligent objects that seem uh, rather hard to, to think of as just, as it were, over there on the other side from us, objects up against us, computers and computing technology. Um, the first significant um, book of Sherry Tuckles was called Life on the Screen from 1995, subtitled Identity in the Age of the Internet. And it really was just, she went and asked a lot of people, a lot of children, just what they thought about their computers. Um, uh, more recently, she's edited a number of um, critical anthologies in which she's invited people working in different areas to talk about objects, often with a um, with very extraordinary kind of curio curiosity, fascination, tenderness, and passion. Um, a, a volume entitled uh, Evocative Objects, for example, followed uh, in short order by two other volumes, The Inner History of Devices from 2008 and Falling for Science, Objects in Mind, uh, ag again in 2008. Obviously a very rich theme for Sherry Turkle there. Um, anthropology and ethnography has also, um, as I've suggested, had a strong involvement or investment with the place of objects in human collective life. Um, and um, in the work of um, local boy Daniel Miller from University College over there, um, we find a very, very rich and energetic um, uh, expatiation on the ways in which human beings, um, and he sort of wants to say all human beings, differently in different ways, but really all human beings in all imaginable and actual circumstances, uh, form their lives through <coughs> their relations with things. In a book called The Comfort of Things, um, he went to a street in South London and just knocked on a lot of doors, just, I mean, it took you know, a year or so, and talked to a lot of people in a lot of detail about their homes, about the objects in their homes, what sort of work they were doing, why they were there, how they'd been chosen, why they liked them, if they did. Um, and the conclusion to The Comfort of Things suggests that in a certain way, this is a kind of a, an imminent holding together as you go along by the edges kind of way of making sense that, um, that replaces those big explanations that postmodernism um, had suggested no longer had the same kind of credibility. Social science, he says, and especially the version of it which took form around the notion of postmodern, seems entirely mistaken in assuming that the decline of society and culture would lead to disordered fragmentation. On the contrary, among the things once accomplished by religion or the state, but now increasingly delegated downwards to individuals and households, is the responsibility for creating order and cosmology. Dialectical philosophy regards modern people as just as authentic as those of the past. An order, moral or aesthetic, is still an authentic order, even if one creates it for oneself and makes it up as one goes along, rather than just inheriting it as tradition or custom. That um, slightly provocative phrase, dialectical philosophy, I think he means it in a very different way from which uh, many of those who've used it before might have meant it. This dialectical philosophy uh, is um, uh, intended, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little phrase, but it's intended to mount really a very serious and sustained argument against or an alternative perspective to the idea that somehow if you live through things, then you're surrendering your humanity. I mean, the one thing that we all know for sure, because the sort of thing we don't need to think about, is that objects aren't subjects. And if we live our lives in objects, then we're giving up, you know, we become robots, become objects, we're rarefied, alienated. All that cluster of intuitive associations that suggest that somehow objects are death whereas subjective life is somehow free of objects, is, is life, freedom, all of that. All of that is um, put at risk, or is intended to be put at risk, in uh, uh, Daniel Miller's work. So there's, a, there's an entire body of critique that comes out, I suppose, um, on the one hand of Marx on commodity fetishism, on notions of reification, and Freud, uh, with 
in some ways parallel ideas of the fetishizing of objects and the fixation of human subjects around objects that, as it were, represent a kind of locking or blocking or pinning down of what would otherwise be um, free uh, energies and possibilities. All of that way of thinking um, is intended to be at least displaced by what I've been calling thing theory, and especially in, in Daniel Miller, I think. Um, and I'll stop when I've very briefly pointed to two um, ways in which that might be said to play out. In more recent work, Bruno Latour has become much more interested, not so much in the history of particular scientific objects, instruments, or devices, but in our relation to the things of the world. He's very, very, I mean, what he would like to do, this is a very, very venerable tradition in sociology, despite the fact it's only been around for 120 years. Most sociology aims to dissolve itself. Let's stop doing sociology, says Latour. Let's stop pretending that there is, a, there is something that we can call society or social relations that represents a distinctive object in the world and a distinctive object of study. There just isn't, because the things we call societies are always bound up with the things that are supposed to be non-social, especially natural things, the things of the world, never more so than now. Um, and uh, uh, so, so he's, he's, he wants, as it were, to put the, the things about which or around which <coughs> social structures form back into the picture. Um, there was an exhibition called... Um, uh, I've forgotten what it's the title of it, um, in, called Atmospheres of Democracy, that he mounted um, with uh, the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, or partly with him, in 2005. And the catalogue uh, of that exhibition, entitled Making Things Public, has a very interesting um, uh, introduction by Bruno Latour, in which he makes this point about a new kind of politics in which things, you know, air, water, radiation, forests, and so forth, would be the object, would have to be the object of any kind of social science, any kind of political science. And who could deny that they absolutely are? And yet, extraordinarily, arbitrarily, things do seem to have dropped out of the picture heretofore. Um, so he, he, he looks towards the end of um, quotation 11, an object-oriented democracy which tries to redress this bias in much of political philosophy. We simply want to pack loads of stuff into the empty arenas where naked people were supposed to assemble simply to talk. Uh, among the moves he makes is to remind us, as Heidegger reminds us, but for different purposes, that the German word, das Ding, actually means a matter of concern or an assembly. A the, the, the Scandinavian word, the Norse word thing, means a coming together to discuss something. Um, a matter of concern. Um, and finally, I think I would want to po point to um, a somewhat more, uh, I'm really tempted to call it mystical, uh, but it's certainly um, more visionary sense of how it is that we might begin to develop an ethics or a politics in which things work on us. Um, Michel Serre, in a, in, in a book that got him into a lot of trouble in 1995, called Le Contrat Naturel, The Natural Contract, which has been translated, suggested that we need to do an impossible thing. We need to imagine that nature could become party to a legally enforceable contract with us. Now, nature can't. Nature can't sign a contract, can't sue for redress. But we have nevertheless to have a legal fiction of a contractual relation with a non-contractual agent. In a similar way, um, uh, Jane Bennett, in her book Vibrant Matter, A Political Ecology of Things, suggests that things need to be, as it were, allowed or understood to bear upon us ethically as though they had something like the same rights um, and effects um, as, as human agents. The notion of thing power, um, and I'm going to end, I think, just by quoting a couple of sentences here. The notion of thing power aims to attend to the it as an acton, 
I will try, impossibly, to name the moment of independence from subjectivity possessed by things, a moment that must be there since things do, in fact, affect other bodies, enhancing or weakening their power. I will try, last sentence, to give force to a vitality intrinsic to materiality in the process absolving matter from its long history of attachment to automatism or mechanism. Um, since I do have 30 seconds left, I might as well introduce Spinoza at this point. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, well, if you start reading Spinoza, it's often said you'll just never get out. But um, uh, the short story is that Spinoza has become immensely important uh, for modern writers, especially Latour. He's immensely important for Deleuze as well, precisely because Spinoza just sees no difference between subjects and objects. There are just things that have effects. There are things that affect other things. Some of them have a, a complex self-relation and self-understanding, perhaps, um, but that doesn't draw a, a, you know, a kind of fundamental, that doesn't make a fundamental slice through creation. There are just things, there are bodies that have effects on other bodies. That Immanentism, that, that refusal of splits or levels, um, is, is what can result um, in, in some of the more impassioned pleas on behalf of things um, that we find exemplified in Jane Bennett's work. So I'm going to stop. We have no um, way of showing you anything yet. Um, but I, 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 I'm going to move straight on because I, I want us to have the whole of the afternoon just for you to talk to us and among yourselves. Um, and uh, so if you have a question, write it down and save it up. Uh, and we'll move straight on so that we can get to, to lunch um, in a seasonable way.